share my screen. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to welcome you to the first ever AIM for Inclusion with OTAP um, presentation. This is a new, brand new series that OTEP is doing this year um, for the first time, and primarily because we wanted to have some, some good, solid information available to you for um, the work that we've been doing for the last two or three years um, in uh, developing materials and information about accessible educational materials. You'll see on this slide that um, your sign-in registration to Zoom is your record of attendance, and you can receive uh, contact hours for that. You see the bit.ly um, address so, so that you can go to the folder where the slides are uh, housed and um, we are recording this series and it will be posted in that same handout folder after this session today. My name is Gail Bowser and I am very excited to welcome you to this new series. I work as an independent consultant and uh, facilitator for the Oregon Technology Access Program. Um, I work as an independent consultant in many programs around the country, but these Oregon programs and uh, webinars and webinar series are some of my very favorites. So I'm thrilled to be able to be a part of this new eight part series that we're gonna do this year to make sure that basic information about AIM is available to everybody in the state of Oregon. Um, the project is um, sort of sponsored by the Oregon AIM cohort. Oregon is one of seven states which uh, was chosen to partner with the National AIM Center through CAST uh, to participate in a technical assistance grant. So um, our goal is to make information about accessible educational materials available throughout the state and create statewide systems for making those more uh, available and useful to students with disabilities. Accessible educational materials are print and technology-based educational materials that are hence enhanced to make them usable across the range of learner variabilities, across the range of uh, accessibility needs for all our students. This includes providing options for learners who have challenges with vision, fine motor, comprehension, and really learners across the lifespan. I think you'll hear later some of the work we're doing in the area of transition and working with adults who need accessible educational materials. That'll be later in the series. We love your contributions and your uh, ability to chime in and chat with us and uh, share your ideas and information. So you're muted as you enter the session, but we want to encourage you to either unmute yourself or ask, and ask questions or type your questions into the chat box. The best part of these Zoom meetings is the ability to interact. So we really want to encourage you to do that, especially on a new series like this where we're all um, getting to know each other a little bit. Also, if you can, if you're in a situation where you can show your screen so that we can get to know who our participants are and uh, be able to see you, uh, we love that too, but we understand that sometimes you're in situations where you can't do that. So our first session today is 
called What is AIM and Why Does AIM Matter? And for our presentation today, we have two of the stars of the Oregon AIM cohort. We have George Shan Hardy, who is a low incidence specialist for the Oregon Department of Education. And she's going to be representing the Oregon Department of Education today as we talk about what Oregon rules and laws say. And then we have Deborah Fitzgibbons, who is the coordinator of both the OTAP and the RSOI programs at Douglas Education Service District, and also the um, primary leader of the AIM cohort grant that we have been uh, working on and, and we wanna tell you about today. So I'm going to stop sharing, welcome you all again, and uh, turn it over to Deb and to Georgianne to follow the rest of the program. De Deb, you're muted. So we're so new at this. We've only been doing Zoom for what, five years, six years now. So uh, how often are we still saying you're muted? I say some of my best work whenever I've been muted. So thank you for that, Gail. And thank you for the introduction. It is my pleasure to kick off our first of eight monthly um, uh, webinars in the AIM series. Today we're beginning with what is AIM and why does uh, AIM matter? And I thank you for asking. We're about to jump into that. AIM for Inclusion with OTAP webinar series. And uh, the OTAP program uh, grant is brought to you through the Oregon Department of Education. It has been uh, housed here at the Douglas CSD in beautiful Roseburg. Oregon uh, for more than 30 years and Gail Bowser was the first person to be in my position all those years ago and well it's just a short time uh, Gail is uh, just a, a bit seasoned uh, but I'm thrilled to be able to continue on her legacy and to work with her to uh, to do that across Oregon and I am again thrilled uh, to work with George Ann Hardy a low incident specialist uh, she is the liaison for both the OTAP and RSI grants uh, through ODE, and it's been a pleasure getting to know her and to lead this project. Uh, Georgian, is there any welcome that you would like to say to folks? Okay, <laughs> let's just get this show on the road, says Georgian, so that's what we're going to do. And as Gail said, we are one of seven states that was chosen uh, to be part of the uh, National Cohort for Technical Assistance through the AIM Center. You'll see here that Oregon is the only one in the West, so we are uh, trying hard to represent all of you. It really is an idea that goes across the lifespan. Beginning in our early childhood, we need to make sure that our kids have access to curriculum and uh, to carry that all the way through into the workforce and beyond. Access is the first step to inclusion. And so our objectives for today are to really begin with that common vocabulary and make sure that we're on solid ground. We know that we are in the world of education and the world of acronyms. So we want to make sure that we are uh, uh, coming together and having a clear understanding of what accessible educational materials really means. We're also going to look at the POOR principles, another acronym that I'll be explaining to you, but it's really some concepts principles uh, to keep in mind whenever you're designing um, material that's going to be used with anyone really. If as a, a therapist or as any type of support, the people we come in contact with um, may need the accommodations. We may be thinking of them mostly for students, but really being able to think beyond and outside of the box that making sure that everything we do is accessible. So the poor principles we'll talk about, and we're going to really reference 
reference the relevant state and the national uh, legislation, as you hear the definition and hear us talk about it, it makes sense. But going beyond making sense, it's also the law. And so it's not optional. We want to make sure that everybody uh, is on common or on the same foundation uh, before we move forward. So we all know, and we've probably seen this slide a million times, that the message, in, message from ODE is all about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And as you can see here, we are also talking about access. We firmly believe that if you don't have access to curriculum and to all of the experiences that peers are afforded in the classroom, that you're really not included. You're parallel playing and that's not okay. So we wanna make sure that all kids have access. So I just challenge you to think about, well, what does access really mean to you? Access, whenever I ask this question in workshops, people will talk about, well, I need to have money to get someplace, so I need access. So we're talking about demographics. We're talking about being on the other side of the state where it's harder to get to professional development. So access means all of those things. Today, we're talking about access and really making sure that our marginalized populations, as it says here, all are considered whenever we're planning to make sure that nobody's voice is left away from the tables. So we'll begin with our definition. What are accessible educational materials? And this um, is uh, used across the country. It's used again across the lifespan. So they are those print and technology-based materials that includes anything that's printed, uh, worksheets, uh, textbooks, any core material, anything that is used by the student and published primarily for use in programs, elementary or secondary. So AIM is all of those materials that you're using with your students. So what that really means is that a person with a disability, they can get the same information engage in the same interactions and experiences, enjoy the same service, as it says here, in an equally effective and integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. It's not having to jump through additional hoops to get my material because perhaps I'm a Braille user. Uh, anybody is able to have that material that is handed out to them at the same time as their peers. So equivalent ease of use as a person without a disability. When you get your handouts, you're going to see uh, that they are uh, still in, in slide format. We did not lock those. We want you to be able to use them. If you want to share this idea with your uh, administrators, feel free to do that. And information is only good if you share it. But you'll see we have links to the information inside uh, the AIM Center. You're going to see reference quite often because that's who we're in partnership with. And they have such an extensive uh, list of resources available. So, accessible formats, what does that mean? Well, if I make a copy of something and I send it to myself from my uh, copier, is that accessible? It starts off as an image. And so some of our copiers will allow us to make an accessible uh, document, but sometimes you're giving somebody something that is only an image that if you click on it, that's all you can do is click on it. So is it accessible? No. It's not. So what are the accessible formats that provide the same information in another form? Well, we're looking at accessible formats of text-based materials. And as you can imagine, that includes Braille, includes accessible digital text, so more than just an image on a screen. It includes large print, audio, and it includes tactile graphics. But we're also talking about formats of video. Um, it, we need to have captioning. If you see that uh, captioning is turned on, uh, we are uh, intent on making sure that closed captioning is part of all that we do, because many people, it goes beyond persons with hearing impairment who might need to see it. Uh, many people really benefit and are able to focus better with closed captioning. So if you're in doubt, should I turn it on? The answer is yes, please do. ASL, 
uh, audio descriptions, uh, accessible format of audio, text, and transcript. So you're seeing that it's different formats. We're presenting information to folks so that they can take away what they need. And so the, um, the link is here. Uh, we also have a QR code. Um, QR codes are very handy, particularly for those who have trouble in typing in the information into, uh, into the address bar on a website, let's say. So the uh, QR codes are um, a great way of sharing links. When we consider designing for accessibility, we want to make sure, again, that our information is accessible to everyone. So these are some of the principles that we're going to be talking about. The four principles um, that uh, define the qualities of an accessible experience. Again, we're with an acronym, but P stands for perceivable, O for operable, U for understandable, and R for robust. So we're not watering down information, we're giving it in a different format. So when we consider perceivable, that means that we want to make sure that it is possible for all our learners to see and hear the information. That takes into account the varied ways in which learners recognize it. So if you are putting images into your materials, it's very easy to add a different text behind that We'll be talking about this and the how-tos in, in the future, but adding a, a text behind your images, if someone is using a screen reader and they come to an image, they hear nothing. They see nothing if that's the um, disability or the barrier that they have. But if you add text images or text description behind those images, anyone who's using a screen reader is going to be able to hear what is represented on that image. We want to make sure that we're including closed captions and transcripts, that the color contrast is there. So you'll find a color contrast check, uh, checker here, but just knowing that, yes, sometimes it looks really pretty, those colors together, but there needs to be enough difference between the foreground and the background so that it stands out so that a person can distinguish what's on the page. And so don't use color alone. And again, making sure that it's readable and legible makes it perceivable for all of our, our learners. When we think about operable, this is really helping our learners to be able to navigate through it. So some people are going to need to use a, a hit an alt or hit the tab to tab through a document because perhaps they aren't uh, able to see it clearly. So we need to make sure that whenever we're creating something that we're building in those structures uh, that will allow somebody to tab through. Uh, creating descriptive links. If we add a link that is HTTPS, blah, 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 and 40 characters, when somebody's using a screen reader, it starts reading all of that out loud. And so we want to make sure that we're using descriptive links uh, rather than uh, making them guess on exactly what it is that they're looking for. So there's keyboard accessibility, again, making sure that we're providing sufficient time for folks and avoid content that flashes because that's really not accessible for anybody. When we look at the U in poor, we're talking about understandable and supporting our learners through a consistent and predictable design. So providing clear directions, trying to be consistent using plain language and identifying it. So when somebody comes in, they're always having to wonder about what the directions are at the same time they're trying to learn something new. That's two red letter activities happening at the same time. If we can be consistent in the way that we present information and in clear directions, that allows our, our learners and ourselves to focus more on uh, the, the content rather than how am I going to take it in. So being consistent helps to be understandable. Robust. Works for our learners on a variety of the technologies. Regular, educational, instructional technology, and assistive technology. So making sure that we're providing descriptions and each of the programs that you use, including PowerPoint and Word, and uh, all of them have a built-in accessibility check. And we'll be talking about that in future sessions uh, on just how you go through that and make sure that your document is accessible. And then the other is if you have somebody who you're creating something for, sit with them and go 
through it with them and just ask them, is this accessible for you? What do I need to do to make sure that you can get the same information as your peers? So P-O-U-R, perceivable, um, operable, understandable, and robust. So when AIM really works and it works well, it's a combination of all of those things together. So what we're looking at is the materials that you're providing and then the technology that is used, perhaps is used by everybody, that it's interoperable, that you can do uh, the, the same things um, and, and that, that the material is intended for. That you are um, also, some students are going to nest, uh, may need to use assistive technology. And so assistive technology is assistive if that person doesn't have another way to perform an activity. So if I have technology that is being used by everyone, if you take that technology away from everyone and I don't have a way to do it, I don't have a plan B, well, for me, that was assistive technology. And we need to make sure that we are documenting that. So it's when our materials, the technology available to everyone and anything that's peripheral that we need, when they all work together, it's because that material was accessible to start with. So I uh, mentioned to you that this is not just a fancy idea. It's not just a fling that we're, uh, we're diving into accessibility. It is the law, and these laws have been around for uh, quite some time, um, but we're going to dive into them. And again, feel free to use them, to quote them uh, whenever you are working with peers or administrators. And I am going to invite George Ann Hardy to uh, unmute herself and take us through for a little walk uh, through the laws pertaining to provision. Hi, I am Georgian Hardy, and I am the Low Incidence Disability Specialist for the state of Oregon. Um, and I welcome you all, and I'm really happy that you all could be here. And for those of you that are watching us um, on replay, thanks. Uh, so the first, I get the really exciting part. I get the law. It's so fun. Um, and if we were in person, I really would make you play games and give you prizes. But since we're online, <laughs> um, I am just going to kind of talk at you a little bit. Um, so next slide. So the U.S. Department of Justice and um, the Department of Education shared this thought in a joint statement in 2021. I will say I am not a fan of people reading me slides. However, for accessibility, I am going to read things so that it does um, get transposed so that people can read it or can, can access it later. So requiring the use of emergency technology in a classroom environment when the technology is inaccessible to an entire population of individuals with disabilities is discrimination. Unless those individuals are provided accommodations or modifications that permit them to receive all the educational benefits provided by the technology in an equally effective and equally integrated manner. So I, I think the, the goal here is that we really want people to understand that this is really important, um, that everyone has the right to access. So some things have changed, but really the, the idea over time has not. Oh, and you already did. Thank you. <laughs> um, so then we look at the rights of the LEA. And um, if I will just say what LEA means, I won't make someone come up with that answer. Um, so that is the local education um, agency, which would be um, your school district. So part in the red is a really important part here. Nothing in this section relieves an LEA of its responsibilities. So there aren't excuses that we can give. Um, you have to ensure as the LEA that children with disabilities who need instructional materials in accessible formats, but are not included under the definition of blind or other persons with print disabilities, or who will need materials that cannot be produced from NIMAS, that are, which we're going to talk about in a minute, receive those instructional materials in a timely manner. I want you to take that phrase in a timely manner, and I want you to just put it in your, in your head, and I want you to think about it, maybe jot down a note or two if you feel like it. Um, what does that mean to you? What, 
when I say in a timely manner, what does that mean to you? And we're going to get to a definition later. And uh, you might be surprised what that definition actually means. All right, next slide. So OAR 581-015-2060 is um, about accessible materials. So this aligns with that theme that I was just talking about, the NIMAS standards. So the first section, school districts must ensure the timely provision of print instructional materials, including textbooks that comply with the National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standards. That is NIMAS. For students who are blind print or print disabled in accordance with OAR 581-022-2355. And number two, school districts must ensure the, and again, we're going into red, timely provision of instructional materials in accessible formats to children who need instructional materials in accessible formats, including those who are blind or print disabled. So that includes students with many other disabilities that may need accessible formats. Um, next slide. So IDEA assurances are um, things that we as the state as a SEA, which is the state educational agency, have to um, sign off on and agree to. So number 22 of our assurances are that the LEA adopts National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standards, or NIMAS, for the purpose of providing instructional materials to blind persons or other persons with print disabilities in a timely manner in accordance. So in other words, we have to sign off on it, so does your LEA they have to sign off on it. If an LEA, um, they separately assure also that all instructional materials are provided in a timely manner to blind persons or others with print disabilities. Again, NIMAS can be used for other people. You do not have to be blind. Um, next slide. This is the part we're talking about, accessible education materials in your IEP. This is the part, the boots on the ground, hit it running. Um, when you hit your special factors page, I know we have at least six different um, programs that we use for IEPs in our state. We do not have one um, one, for, one program for this. And we have, and thank you for that. You're right. This isn't accessible. This is kind of an example to show you where it is. Now the next slide will actually be bigger. <laughs> Oh, the IEP page. <laughs> yes, well, I agree, the IEP page. Um, so the part on this part G is the part that we're gonna talk about accessible materials. And if you look at this, um, it's does the student require one or more specialized formats, braille, large print, audio, and or digital text of educational materials because of blindness or other disabilities, preventing them from the use of standard print materials. So this used to be a confusing section. People just thought you had to be blind, visually impaired. That was the only time we looked at this. We didn't look at it for anyone else. That is not the case. Um, I, I'm guilty of doing the same thing in the past when I was writing IEPs, and that is not the case. Actually, we are looking at this for any student who may need accessible materials. And again, just a reminder, we have all of our um, LEAs have adopted different IEP writing programs. Um, I'm, I am most familiar with TINET. And the, this page, the special factors page, it can be different in any LEA. We as an organization, as the um, SEA, as the state, we actually give you recommendations and we have models and examples, but the district is allowed to do what they need as long as it's in accordance with the law. So if you're in a district that they don't have this spelled out, you do need to make sure that you are talking about AIM in the IEP in some area. Make sure that it is addressed and documented. Next slide. Now we're gonna to get to some of the laws about um, that are pertaining to the acquisition of AIM, which is accessible educational materials. So the first OAR we're gonna speak about um, is the SEA. 
as a part of any print instruction materials adoption process, procurement pro contract or practice, or instrument used for purchase of print instructional materials. So we have to adopt something. We have to adopt as the state, we have adopted the NIMAS NIMAC process. We have that, as you have the ex access to that as a state of Oregon educator. Your LEA, if they choose not to do that, they still have to provide, and I think I'm skipping ahead, sorry, um, to the next one. The school district must pro process, must identify whether the district coordinates with the National Instructional Materials Access Center. So if your district does not actually participate with NIMAC and they are not using that material, they must have another way that they are providing these materials to students. I think most of our districts are actually using the NIMAC process. So um, the next slide. Oh, sorry, I did forget the one part in red on that slide. Number four, sufficient quantities, including those produced in alternate formats and those that cannot be produced from the NIMAS files shall be available in a, oh, there's that phrase again, timely manner to accommodate the number of students who will be using them at any one time. So I don't know what you thought timely manner might have meant, but here's what it means. A timely manner means the materials are available at the same time materials are available for students who do not need materials in alternative formats. So if you have a student that needs an alternate format, they should be receiving that format at the very same time the other students are receiving their format. I'm just going to pause and let that sink in. Now, and Georgianne, does this happen overnight? Is it like I go someplace and poof, I've got my material that I need? Oof. <laughs> Not typically. So this is something that school districts need to be prepared for. You need to have these um these processes in or in in process in bleh, sorry <laughs> you need to can we cut can I <laughs> you need to have this process taken care of and ready to go for all students because you never know when you have a student that might move in who needs this service all right so we're going to uh, go to the next slide in just a moment and talking about where you can find out additional information about what Oregon has going on uh, about instructional materials adoption. But I wanted to just take a moment and, and expound on what I just said. Does it happen automatically? Does it happen quickly? Well, we're going to be talking in a future webinar about some of the sources and where you can go and get the information. You'll hear things such as Bookshare and uh, American Printing House and uh, OTMC, Oregon Technology Media. But what we want to stress is that it does take a little bit of time. So if, as soon as you know what books or materials a student is going to be using, that's a good time to start the process. When we consider uh, Braille, for instance, and don't worry, most of you are probably never going to have to go out and seek Braille. Uh, there is somebody who uh, you can contact who can help with all all of that. But in the Braille process, if you need to hand a student the Braille at the same time that school starts in, in September, as the same time as their peers, you need to back that up for Braille. It needs to be, uh, you need to begin that process in February for something uh, that you're going to hand a student in September. So it does take a bit of time and time um, is is one of those things that people say, well, I just don't have time. Well, obviously, we know that it is not an option uh, for us to say, I'm sorry, I did not have time to get you your book. But I just really want to stress that, uh, again, it's not optional, it's required. And sometimes it does take time. But as George Ann said, if we plan that it, it, for somebody, we may not have anybody in our class right now who needs alternate materials. But if we really look ahead and make sure that we're purchasing it or making sure that it's available for students, well, then we've got it ready. Kind of a form of universal design, making sure I have it ready for everyone. Georgianne, did you want to add something there? 
So really, one of the biggest pieces of this is when you're looking at curriculum adoption, which I'm sure you as as therapists are not doing often, um, you have your own things you're doing. But when school districts are looking at curriculum adoption, we really want to make sure that we're looking at um, curriculum that has built in accessibility. Um, and that is one of the things that we are here at the State Department looking at um, helping making that a little bit easier for school districts. We're trying to do that. One of the places that we are working on some of these pieces is the OER Commons. Um, um, so we have someone who is uh, fabulous, her name, well, I won't give you her name, that, I won't out her, um, who works in our OER Commons. She's amazing. And um, I just don't want everyone to email her all at once. So I won't say Well, I'm going to out her <laughs> because she's part of our leadership team. And Ajali, Ajali Moore is amazing. And so I'm going to out her because she can't get enough accolades. She's really been going uh, and, and moving forward, working hard to make sure that uh, that our districts are not alone in trying to figure out what's accessible, that they're vetting things at the state level that are already uh, proven to be accessible that folks can go out there and get. And as, again, as George Ann said, guidance from the state, all of this, and then sometimes districts, whenever they go in and they look at something, the accessibility may not be what's at the, the forefront of their mind. So even if uh, you are not responsible necessarily for choosing curriculum, just always having in the back of your mind, who are we leaving out if we don't consider the accessibility? And so again, these, um, these links uh, will be available to you in your document. We've got the web page, ODE, the AIM uh, materials web page, the accessibility and instructional materials. There's a video that we've put together. As we are uh, spreading the professional development, we're cross-presenting over stakeholder groups because everyone has a role. You may not be the person who's going out and acquiring it, but everyone has a role in making sure that accessibility is considered. As I see that many of you are, are therapists on with us today, uh, you are the front line for accessibility. You can see whenever your students might have difficulty independently turning pages. Just knowing that there are procedures and processes in place that can help your students get what they need if it's accessible, then I'm going to be able to tab through a document or I'm going to be able to hear it if I need to for my comprehension. So whenever you, whenever, um, our, our districts are, are going out and purchasing. There is sample language. There is a template, and we've included links to that uh, sample language that can go into uh, the purchase order to make sure that it is part of the order that you're placing with the uh, with the curriculum company or the um, the publishers. And the OER Commons, uh, that is a place that we're housing our information. It's a part of our communication plan where we're storing all of these wonderful videos uh, that we are putting together that you can go back to and reference again. The OER Commons is a place that you can go and search for materials that others have put in. There are lots of uh, resources within the OER Commons. And I'm just going to say that uh, uh, our therapists are also uh, bringing material into the OER Commons as a place to house them uh, and uh, look for a resource very soon uh, inside of the OER Commons. Gail, you're muted. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if you could say what exactly the OER Commons is. I wasn't actually familiar with it until I got involved in this project. And I think there may be some other people on the on the webinar today who don't know what that acronym stands for. Well, I'm going to go ahead and take you, I'm just going to go ahead and, and diverge uh, from the PowerPoint for a moment, and I'm going to take you to the OER Commons page, and it is uh, open education resource, and so it's a place where you can, is a repository for your information, and um, so you, you will see that this is the Oregon Accessible Educational Materials, that's what's linked to the collection, and uh, you'll see that, and, and I believe Vajali is going to be on and going through this again in the future, but this is just a 
place for you to go and see uh, the resources that we have already put together. But people are able to load the information in. And because it's open, if you loaded something, George Ann, that I wanted to use, I can come in and you have given permission for people to take that and rework it and perhaps modify it to their own needs. And so it, it that's what you're agreeing to whenever you put the information in. It's open educational resources and, and we I, are listed. I, Go ahead, Gail. I think it's important to say that uh, we are a very small part of a very large actual international effort to um, to promote open educational resources through the OER Commons. Um, almost every state in the country and then smaller programs like the AIM cohort have those databases available to you. So yeah, there you go. Here's a list of just some of them and it goes on forever. Um, I, for me, it's become a really nice place to look for uh, educational resources that are actually applicable to whatever project I'm working on. So I would encourage you to look at our OER Commons uh, site for the AIM cohort, but also take a look at what some other people are doing in, in this rain, uh, vein, in this vein. So I'm just going to snap back to the uh, main page. That's oercommons.org. And uh, this is uh, where you can go in and look at hubs, but you can sign up for this. It's free. It's not, you, there's no uh, charge for being part of it. But what I mentioned about um, being able to find uh, resources, what are you looking for? Well, here I am looking for something about, uh, well, I, you can see I've looked before for things about therapy, uh, but maybe I'm looking for a particular topic, something about uh, arts and humanities. Uh, I'm able to determine the education education level, arts and humanities for preschool. That should be interesting. Uh, but looking at the different choices, making selections, and then you're able to look through things that people have submitted uh, that meet your criteria. And there are lesson plans that you can get. There's a variety of information. But this, as Gail said, this is a um, a treasure trove of resources that many of our folks around our state are not aware of yet. So that's why we're really making sure that we include these conversations in all of our um, professional development. And so this is a great place. Go out there and explore it and make sure you uh, visit the group. And that group is the Oregon Accessible Educational Materials. And I'll say it again, stay tuned, therapists, for a resource uh, that is for onboarding of new therapists. Have I got your attention? I hope so. So we're just going to jump back and um, uh, look at our uh, slideshow again. These are the resources for adoption. We also, um, at the folders that are in there, we are adding to on a regular basis. You might have seen this as we went over to the OER Commons, but you'll see that we have it uh, separated out. Each one of the numbers shows how many resources are in there. Stars Mill High School Oops. and the Fayette County Public Schools in Georgia are working to establish 21st century classrooms to integrate technology into curriculum. So uh, I'm going to come back to that. Thank you for reminding me that you're there. And uh -huh. so <laughs> I, I won't forget you. Um, but what we are, uh, uh, okay, so did I finish my, okay. Naturally, it's not responding. So I'm just going to say that we have talked about the definition Hopefully, you are able to work on your elevator speech about what accessibility is. If I asked you to uh, define that and put you on the spot right now, could you say what accessibility is? It's really making sure that you have left no one away from the table, making sure that you're considering those folks who might have um, might have visual impairments, might have fine motor and can't turn pages, might uh, have comprehension that they need to be able to hear it and track along with it. And so you'll find legal procedures uh, whenever we talk about the processes. Well, how do I even know who needs it? There's a section about identifying student needs, um, how to use the materials, uh, uh, links for professional development. When I talk about everybody has a role 
role in um, accessible materials. Uh, we talk about the roles and responsibilities. Uh, our administrators have certain roles. They may not be the ones who are working directly with the students, but as we all know, uh, administrator uh, support and buy-in from the beginning of any project is crucial. So just making sure that everybody knows the role that they can play. And as far as procurement, we've talked about that. We've talked about how you can, um, the different ways that you can get to get the material. And if you aren't purchasing it accessible, then that means that somebody has to go in and retrofit. And by retrofitting, uh, that could be that you have to take a work. Whenever I was really working closely in the classroom, it usually ended up being the OT working with a student who would take that worksheet that wasn't accessible, run to the office, make a copy of it, get it into a digital format and not just digital, but accessible. So if we purchase up front, that makes it so much easier to disseminate. But if we don't, then we are constantly charged with retrofitting. And so the, um, the data collection is important. And we have discovered through this process that data for assistive technology and AIM in themselves uh, is hard to come by. And the accountability to make sure that folks are reporting that is hard to come by. Uh, but I think we're going to be seeing some changes to that in the near future. So what is the data collection, the funding, all of these things that need to be considered or are part of the process. Here in Oregon, we've had three primary goals to create the statewide system, to uh, share a communication plan, and one that we are exceptionally proud of is our movement to create um, a guide for student self-advocacy. And so look for that in the near future, because we know that the only way for our kids who leave us after they uh, complete our education and transition to whatever comes next, the only way to ensure that they know what they need is to keep them in the conversations and help them to learn what they need and also to role play and to practice asking for it. So then our kids can leave us more aware of what they need and um, more able to uh, know that they are entitled to that and worthy of that and that gives them skills lifelong. So look for that in the near future. We'll be talking about a student advocacy guide. Uh, the ad, the, um, the accessibility also goes to our state assessments. So we have, as part of our cohort, we have people who are uh, at state level who are part of ORTII, Response to Intervention. We have a wonderful state assessment person who is uh, listening to all of our questions and responding um, very, uh, very quickly to know that we are all on the same page. So again, as George Ann said, this isn't just for kids with IEPs or what used to be known as print disability. Print disability is now in law, it's eligible person, uh, which is not quite as clear, uh, but it is for anyone who has an IFSP, an IEP, 504. And I believe that we will all know that whenever we create and make something better for a person with a disability, it makes it better for everyone. So that any of us who have a preference to be able to listen to something, we don't have to go out and beg for it. It's part of what is going to come to us automatically. And so this is our focus, making sure we have the accessibility. I'm going to uh, go ahead and move to the next. The format of our series is uh, going to be, um, or is, but I had another slide here. Okay. Um, is the format is that we're going to give some content and today just giving you the foundation. When we get together again uh, on our next one is November the 14th and you will get an announcement for that. Jennifer South, who happens to be on with us today, is going to take it from abstract and definitions and foundation that we're talking about. Jennifer is going to show us what that actually means with technology and with the format 
perhaps a document that is not accessible. She's going to show us what that looks like. So Jennifer is going to be with us November 14th, and uh, we'll be sharing and further expounding to help us better understand what that means. So our frame or format is um, to, to talk about how that actually applies to a student. But as I see um, Georgianne has put into the chat box, this is the time that, that we get quiet for a little bit and allow you to think and, and reflect on the things that we've been talking about. And in your world, what does this mean? Or what are your questions about AIM? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask them, type it in the chat box. And as we know, we're all different. Some of us are going to need to go away and process it and come back with our questions next time. It's never too late to get your questions answered. So please let us know what your questions are. I had a yeah, quick are you question. Raising your hand? Yeah. Um, so I, I know that in the past um, I had students who had print needs oh. and um, they were given um, large print. But what it really was was these unwieldy things that the kids would not touch in the classroom because it's made them stand out so far. I'm just wondering if that's changed at all as far as like, you know, instead of because I had to make I had to copy all of the all of the or um, I had to go to borrow the books, but they were just huge. And so it really was a major turnoff for my students who didn't want to stand out. I was just curious if that's changed at all. Well, that is the reason that you just said that people don't want to stand out is the reason that we go through and we help kids find out what's going to work for them. And as soon as they see that, that's when it's abandoned. And that happens quite often. But we always want to start with the student. But uh, the having to print the large, uh, large copies, uh, the large print has changed because our technology now allows us to be able to zoom in or to make adjustments uh, whenever we use it on the computer and everything needs to be individualized and so making sure you're starting with that student and what classes they have what are the materials and keeping the student in the planning and letting them know that here is the option do you believe that you would use the large print well if it's a hard no then you're you're it's an exercise in futility but making sure that they know that it's possible to uh, increase the size of the font on the screen or to, like I said, to be able to zoom in if there's something that you need to see. So technology does afford us some different options now, but I think always going back to the student and getting their buy-in uh, to, um, to make sure that you're on the right page. So Gail is asking, uh, is she curious to know how many people are involved in AIM? How many of you have been involved in this process? I see Lori. Jennifer, I know that you are. You're assistive technology at Northwest Regional. I know you've been involved with that. I'm wondering if the, if some of you who have been involved in AIM could talk a little bit about how you're uh, how you're involved in your practice. Are you the primary person? Are you working with a, a specialist of some sort? Are you on curriculum committees? What? Um, we saw a couple hands, but I'm wondering if somebody would be willing to unmute themselves and tell us a story about what you're doing. And Lori, I saw that earlier, I think that you unmuted yourself, that you were going to either share or ask a question while people are thinking about their own experiences. Would you like to unmute? Thank you, friend. Sure, no problem. And if you guys hear my dogs bark, I apologize ahead of time. They think it's time for me to be finished with work. Um, <laughs> I, I am involved with our, uh, we have two AIM professionals, um, and I am an OT, and last, was it last year? Year before. And where are you? What, what I am you? in Salem-Kaiser School District. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And so two years ago, they just made a, uh, a huge decision that all OTs were going to take on AT in their schools. Um, and we didn't get any training, so it's been a ride. Um, and so I have done tons of continuing ed to be able to work with my friends, uh, AIM. And so we kind of just 
tag team because there's so much crossover. I, um, I work with students who have motor issues, who have vision issues, and either one of us, myself or the AIM team, could issue them a device, an iPad, a touchscreen Chromebook, a smart pen that takes notes for them, any of those things. But um, we have one of us assign the device, and then we each take turns training. Uh, we need to know how to work each other's programs that we use. Uh, Orbit Note has been letting the team down this year. Um, yeah, but Claro PDF has been working well. So, um, you know, just getting out there and trying to figure out what every student needs. My question is this, my biggest problem across the board is when students need to interact with a classroom assignment, online, um, especially at the elementary level, secondary schools are getting a little better about providing accessible assignments, but at elementary school, my kindergartners, they want to cut, they want to color, and when they have, don't have use of either arm um, or have limited use of one arm, they need it to be online. They need a program like Seesaw or Teacher Made where they can record a uh, voice memo where they can tap on the screen to color certain uh, blocks in. Who is doing that? Where are those coming from? Because right now it's me or the IA that I train in the classroom doing it on their own time. You know, Lori, I think you bring up a, a really important point, which is there's levels of AIM, just like there are levels of uh, mobility impairment or more mobility involvement and, uh, and levels of assistive technology. And one of our goals, I think, in the AIM cohort is to choose the things that are uh, most accessible for the most kids to start with so that you as a professional who's working to make sure kids have the accessible materials they need don't have to look at every single kid who needs accessible materials but can train the bulk of uh, you know of your staff who work with children with learning disabilities or or learning challenges of some sort to do that work so that somebody who's an expert like you and a, an expert in accessibility of all sorts can take on those more complicated cases. Um, I think later on we'll be talking in the series about teacher-made materials and how those materials can be uh, made accessible and have, we can ask teachers to do some of that work. But um, but I think we'll always be on a continuum um, about accessibility and the, and the kind of children that you're talking about. Um, we'll probably always need a helper, a, a, a professional helper to have that access. Our goal is to encourage schools to buy materials that are accessible already, have the, uh, follow the laws that George Ann talked to you about earlier. And then, um, so that there's more time and energy for those more complicated kids. And, and that I have really to my question is that those laws that we talked about, do they cover things like interactive worksheets? It's not just having the print material read to her or, you know, have uh, a student that uses Braille. It's not just his Braille books. Say your question again. I was asking if the laws that we talked about cover those uh, classroom assignments that they do. Are we, yes. okay. That was my understanding. I just wanted to double check. And Anything I have to apologize to, to our students. presenters today because I forgot I wasn't one of you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you know, that's the beauty of it is that we are all part of the leadership team, including mm -hmm. Anjali. And I think that we could all say these things in our sleep. Um, but it's when we have wonderful questions that you are presenting, Lori, that it really helps us to think about what it means in the classroom or when we're directly with the student where the rubber meets the road. So we have an ODE view and then there's one about reality and that's where you're dealing it. And so we want to make sure, as Gail says, that things are available and it applies to all educational materials including teacher materials and uh, and that's that's really a struggle uh, whenever we talk about professional development and education how do we reach those people who are creating those materials and so any suggestions any we are available to come and do trainings for folks so please know that um, a, our OTAP is all about professional development we do a lot virtually um, but we are happy to come and and and, uh, do face to face as well. This is not a, uh, a sales pitch, but it is uh, helping you to know what resources are available to you. Uh, there's so much out there that helping to uh, to bring those into what is that I need now and help me to move forward. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, we are moving to really the application to a student. So I'm going to begin. This is a video. Sometimes we're going to have a student profile. Uh, the video that we are about to share uh, comes from Georgia. Uh, it was made by the uh, someone else who was part of our uh, cohort, uh, our national cohort. Georgia is one of those states, but Georgia partners uh, with the Georgia Tools for Life. That is their t state tech act. So so they have it's a it's completely different all of the states that we're working with are, have just completely different setups so uh, but they did create a wonderful video that is also available here on youtube and the uh, aim center site so i'm just going to focus for a second so i can share my screen and we're going to take just a few minutes to listen to a bit of this that helps bring that abstract into more concrete ideas. Stars Mill High School and the Fayette County Public Schools in Georgia are working to establish it? 21st century classrooms to integrate technology into curriculum, instruction, and assessment to support the participation and achievement of all students. By integrating accessible instructional materials and accessible technology in the classrooms for all students, students with disabilities benefit from the flexibility and supports provided and often need only limited or no other accommodations. They recognize that print textbooks represent a fixed medium, one size fits all, which is not accessible to many students with disabilities. To meet the needs of all students, content is provided in flexible digital media, which is available via technology and can be adjusted as needed. To ensure the provision of accessible materials, Georgia law requires that publishers of recommended learning resources or textbooks provide an electronic version of each student edition. Audrey Tony, the principal of Stars Mill High School, like other principals, sets the tone for the staff and student body. She describes how they work to make sure that accessibility for students with print disabilities is considered in the textbook procurement process. Every time we have a adoption in place, the teachers that are on the committees, the coordinators and so forth that are on the committees, they're gonna always look to see what else does that company bring before we make that adoption. If the company, of course, at this point, only have a hard copy, chances are we're not going to adopt that series. Our exceptional children services are always part of those adoption processes, so they're able to also tell the teachers and the companies of their needs as well. There are two key elements of accessibility that must be in place, accessible content and accessible technology. The assistive technology specialist describes some of the technology included in the 21st century classroom. So each classroom has a projector, it has a smart board or a screen. There is a way for the teachers to save their lessons through Edmodo, which is an online sharing. We have portable tablets that also have software that records. So anything the teacher projects can be recorded and then uploaded for students review later. 
In the Fayette County 21st Century Classroom Initiative, all students have access to the same complement of software applications on the district computers. Educators and students also use an online network to collaborate on homework, projects, and resources that is accessible 24-7. It has been very helpful because for those students who misplace papers, for those students who need extra support, those documents are always available. Nothing gets lost anymore. It has to be deliberately deleted. So, you know, the dog ate my homework excuse doesn't exist anymore because their documents are, are always available. And we encourage students to share the documents with their instructors immediately so you can see the progress. The, the teachers can comment, help the students progress through their projects. Assistive technology programs that students with disabilities might need are also installed with the suite of software used across the county. So throughout the county, we have some of those items like Free Natural Reader. It's not special technology. It has become instructional, assisted because it may be a requirement for a student, but it truly is instructional technology that any student struggling can access. By making a comprehensive suite of learning technologies available to everyone, the district removed a key barrier to learning, the stigma associated with students with disabilities using different technology than their peers. All the students have access to it, they're all willing to use it, so then our students who really do require it are more willing to use it. Fayette County Public Schools has a Bring Your Own Technology, or BYOT, initiative. Students are allowed to bring and use their own devices in the classroom. Digital content and resources available through the school network can be accessed by a variety of devices. And the closer we stay to a standard solution, the more readily accepted it is, the more easily it is for the student to find that support regardless of what computer they sit down to. And what technology tool. It could be their personal technology, like a smartphone, it could be a tablet, it could be the classroom computer. By setting up adaptable classrooms with a foundation of accessible technology and flexible digital content, the needs and preferences of most students are met. Students with disabilities often do not need additional accommodations or modifications. However, if needed, they are easily included. That's what it looks like when people have the mindset and become AIM evangelists. That's what you're all going to be thinking by the time we're done with this. You're going to be looking around and saying, who am I leaving out? No, Our AIM cohort after. has been uh, we're meeting together and putting together re resources. Now, this is our fourth year. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to start sharing those resources with you. And the question that Lori asked uh, about, uh, it, should I be reading aloud to the students? Should we? Well, does that lead to independence? It's great that you're doing that, but we also have to remember that life is a participation sport. And in order for our kids to be fully included in the classroom and beyond, we need to make sure that it is accessible to them and that we are helping them to build their independence and access. Yes, it's true that if I have a, uh, a young uh, early childhood or um, early uh, K-12 or Anyone who is uh, starting to learn how to read, well, in the beginning, perhaps I'm going to say, come over here and join me. I'm happy to read with you under the tree. We'll read aloud. I know some of you like that. Some of you, I've got it all set up over here in the computer because I know you like to put on the headphones and listen to it. And for others of you, I know that you like to take the book and crawl in the corner and read. And so just making sure that there are options for kids. Today, I might prefer to have you read to me because I'm having a a tough day, but that just gives the flexibility and it really takes away the stigma of uh, what what it looks like whenever I am the one who needs to have the accommodation. Giving people choices, presenting it up front, and yes, it does take some time, but what we're hoping is that, the, uh, that once people are able to connect the dots to see what that means to them in their own classroom with their own students, that we are changing the uh, 
the trajectory for our students with disabilities and for all students, because it creates a climate of accessibility, of acceptance, and of making sure that we're not leaving anyone away from the table. Gail, I see you'd like to add to that. You're muted. I just want to invite all of you uh, when you come back next time in our for our November session to bring somebody with you who you think might also uh, have an interest or have uh, a, a, a dedication to the uh, promotion of the use of a, a accessible educational materials in your practice and in your world. Um, our goal with this series is to spread the word and to give a basic set of information that can be used by anybody. So therapists, teachers, assistive technology specialists, speech and language clinicians, all those people have a role to play in accessible educational materials. And, and uh, we'd love to see this audience grow. So if you can, bring somebody with you next time. <laughs>